Welcome to our final lesson in our Introduction to Material Processing course. Today, we're going to be focusing on the material life cycle, paying special attention to the environmental impact during material processing. First, let's start by defining what a material life cycle looks like within a product. And this goes beyond just the product being in service. We start with material production. If we think back to lesson one, this is the same as stage one, where we're going from our natural resources, our raw material, and we're processing it to get to our starting material in usable form. Next, we move on to product manufacturing. This encompasses stages two and three from lesson one, where we are changing the shape of our material, processing it to form our product, and taking care of any final details like surface finish. Next, we move out of material processing and move into the product use phase. And finally, when the product reaches end of life, it's disposed of in some way. Now, there are environmental inputs and outputs at every stage within our life cycle. These inputs are often considered resources like energy, feedstocks, transportation, where the outputs are emissions and waste, such as CO2 gases containing nitrogen and sulfur, and liquid and solid waste. But where do these inputs and outputs fit within our life cycle? During material production, we have the transport of raw materials to the production plant, where we'll use energy and feedstocks to process our starting materials. This will produce emissions and waste. Next, we have to transport our starting material to our product manufacturing site, where once again, we have energy and feedstocks put into the chain and emissions created. To get to where our product will be used, you guessed it, we have more transport. Depending on what the product is, it might require energy or even feedstock. Think of a toaster. It needs to be plugged in in order for it to work and you're toasting bread. This can lead to more emissions and waste. And finally, we transport our product to the disposal site. Depending on how the product is disposed of, will likely get more emissions and waste from landfill. Understanding where these inputs and outputs occur during a life cycle and what they are is very important to fully comprehend the environmental impact of your material's life cycle within a product. We assess these inputs and outputs using something called a life cycle analysis, or LCA. LCAs are beneficial in terms of understanding the environmental impacts at each stage which allows us as engineers and designers the ability to make changes to lower the impact. One note about LCAs before we move on. While they offer us a detailed insight into the product's life cycle, they can be quite expensive and time consuming to perform and implement. They're also often done after a product is manufactured. So sometimes it's a little hard to make these changes. So we have our life cycle and we know where and what our inputs and outputs are in terms of environmental impact. How do we reduce or eliminate them, especially for material processing? Let's actually start at the end of our life cycle. Maybe you've heard of something called the three R's as a way to minimize environmental impact. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. We can now see where these three R's fit into our material life cycle in our diagram here. But before we examine if any of these routes are appropriate to take, we must consider why the product reached end of life in the first place. For example, maybe the product simply stopped functioning as intended. Maybe the prices of energy have gone up, meaning it's no longer economically viable to use the product. Or in some cases like single use items in the healthcare industry, there's a legal obligation to dispose of it. If the product was disposed of due to personal preference, then it can be reused. This eliminates all of the emissions associated with creating an equivalent new product to market. But maybe our product can't be reused for whatever reason. We could re-engineer or update it. While this will involve some amount of processing, we are reducing the need for having brand new feedstock being put into this product chain. And depending on the processing techniques used to re-engineer, we might be using less resources and generating less emissions than we would if we were creating something from scratch. And finally, we have recycling. 
we're all familiar with how recycling can help us introduce materials back into the product lifecycle stream in a more environmentally friendly way. But how? Let's think back again to lesson one and take our example of processing aluminum. I explained how challenging it is to go from our natural resource, our raw material bauxite, and get to our starting material, which is pure aluminum. There are many chemicals involved and also many processing steps that are at elevated temperatures, which again require more resources and energy. If I'm able to collect aluminum at the end of product life and with minimal processing, reintroduce it as my starting material, well, I'm gonna save a lot of time energy, resources, and emissions. But what else can we do to reduce the impact of material processing and not considering things at the end of our product's life? Well, maybe I can pick a different material, one that requires less energy and resources to produce while still fitting my design criteria. But maybe there is really only one or two materials that fit my design criteria due to a highly specialized use case. Well, maybe I can choose a different product manufacturing technique, one that requires less resources and generates less material waste. Well, maybe all of the commonly used processing techniques for this class of materials I'm interested in are all highly energy intensive. Maybe I can move the production of my product I can move it closer to the source of the material and where it will be used, so I can minimize transport costs. But what if the material I need is only found in a couple places on planet Earth, and I don't really have that luxury? There are so many different options, each with their own pros and cons, that need to be considered when addressing a problem as complex as reducing the environmental impact during processing. And yet, this is becoming more and more crucial. You can see here an Ashby plot of the annual world production of materials split into categories based on material family. We're producing 10 billion tons of materials a year. That's an outrageous number. And it's important to keep this in mind when making decisions during design about where you're going to source your material and the processes you'll use. The life cycle of a product and all its constituent materials is complex with many moving parts. There are people who dedicate their lives to understanding just a small fraction of this process and how we can reduce its environmental impact. But I hope in today's lesson, I've sparked your interest in paying attention to these things during design. And with that, we've reached the end of this lesson and our course on the introduction to material processing. We've covered different stages of material processing and gone over some examples. We've highlighted the impact that four key variables, temperature, pressure, environment, and time have on material processing. And today we looked at processing and the environment and highlighted some challenges that we face there. My name is Dr. Caitlin Tyler, and thank you so much for joining me.